On March the 6th, the first UK death from coronavirus was reported. By March the 12th, when Boris Johnson gave his first big press conference flanked by Patrick Vallance and Chris Whitty, that number had only risen to 10. However, by this point, there were over 1,000 people who had already died from the disease in Italy, and Britain's lackadaisical approach to the pandemic put it out of step with most of its neighbours. To justify their relaxed approach, the government had cited behavioural science and the concept of herd immunity. The day after that press conference, myself and Aaron Bastani acquainted ourselves with the theories guiding government policy and assessed whether Boris Johnson's government were making a terrible mistake. We've done what can be done to contain this disease, and this has brought us valuable time, but it's now a global pandemic, and the number of cases will rise sharply, indeed the true number of cases, is higher, perhaps much higher than the number of cases we have so far confirmed with tests. And I've got to be clear, we've all got to be clear, this is the worst public health crisis for a generation. Some people compare it to seasonal flu. Alas, that is not right. Owing to the lack of immunity, this disease is more dangerous and it's going to spread further. And I, I must level with you, level with the, the British public. Um, more families, uh, many more families, are going to lose loved ones before their time. But as we've said over the last few weeks, we have a clear plan that we are now working through. And we're now getting on to the next phase in that plan, because this is now not just an attempt to contain the disease as far as possible, but to delay its spread and thereby minimise the suffering. From tomorrow, if you have coronavirus symptoms, however mild, either a new continuous cough or a high temperature, then you should stay at home for at least seven days to protect others and help slow the spread. Uh, that was Boris Johnson at a press conference yesterday. When I, when I watched that, actually, obviously, I, I mean, I'm not particularly reassured whenever Boris Johnson tells me anything, but it was... I think a political masterstroke that every time Boris Johnson comes out at the moment, he's flanked by the government's chief medical officer and the government's chief science officer, because then whenever there's a difficult question, he can pass it on to them. And it seems like, oh, actually, maybe we are being read, like led by, you know, scientifically driven, evidence based people, um, which is definitely the impression that they're trying to give. I, actually, the press conference was, you know, it's quite explanatory in ways. I think the problem was that over the next 12 to, to 24 hours, it seemed like, oh, actually, maybe there would have been some some tougher questions that the journalists there should have asked when it became apparent that maybe whilst what they were suggesting in the short term sounded plausible, it wasn't necessarily enough. I mean, we should get up now, actually, what the... So so what the what it means that we're now in delay phase uh, is, is that some new measures are being implemented which weren't implemented before. And they are that, as, as you heard Boris Johnson say there, that if you've got a continuous cough or a fever, you should now self-isolate for seven days. And also... Uh, they're advising those aged 70 or over not to go on cruises and advising against international school trips. Now, my response, and I think many people's response was like, aren't people doing that already? Like, I would have been quite surprised if up to yesterday there were still six, 70 year olds with a mild fever going on a cruise ship, given that that the, the, seems to be the most common place to incubate and spread this disease. I mean, are people still going abroad? I mean, I just find that kind of weird. Something that's undeniable is that, the and the government aren't denying this, is that their response is kind of out of step with... Most other countries yeah. who are similar, who are in a similar situation to us, who have a similar level of cases, Ireland, for example, has fewer cases than us per, you know, per the population, and they've already closed schools, for example. So, so, the, and, and the government are being very explicit in the fact that they are taking a more relaxed approach to shutting stuff down, and a couple of the justifications for that, and we can look at now. So, one of them is is, is behavioural science. <laughs> So it's this idea, it is a bit sort of like the kind of stuff that gets put in, in books at airports. So it's this idea that you, you, might, you might think that a policy will do this thing, but actually, um, counterintuitively, it could have the opposite effect. So examples of this, you, you might think that shutting a school would mean that less people would get the virus, but actually, if you shut the school, then the kids go home, then they hang out with their grandparents, and then their grandparents... Well, this, came out, this stuff so came out of a book, right? No, I mean, David Halpern Nudge. wrote a book yeah. called Nudge. So Which is like airport reading, right? Free economics kind of stuff. Exactly. And, and the nudge, as, as we mentioned on Wednesday's show, the nudge unit was created in 2010 to advise David Cameron. It was part of his big society. So it was the idea that the state doesn't have to do that much 
to achieve social policy outcomes. What it has to do is, you know, little things, little things to try and nudge people, which is why it's called nudge, in the right direction. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, big, big things that the nudge unit is famous for is sending out text messages uh, to say you need to do your tax return. It actually works for me. That does make me do my tax return on time. But protecting the population from an epidemic is kind of different from trying to get people to, to return their tax forms on they time. They also do that thing where you put like a bee in a urinal and then people don't miss and they piss on the bee. Because they're aiming. Yeah. That's a nudge. Yeah. So that's, it's, that's, it's, that's the kind of... We're that, talking about different, yeah, different levels of seriousness and the costs of if it fails are slightly bigger in this case. Well, no, but they would say, look, you know, every year the economy spends £150 million on cleaning toilets and that could be saved through this tiny, you know, behavioural change. Yeah. I mean, obviously, I think I've got no problem with them putting bees and spiders in urinals. I mean, it's, it, which means that you target your piss. But I don't necessarily think that that should be qualification for then managing... That is honestly one of the most famous examples. I'm not sort of saying that to belittle yeah, yeah, no, the no, nudge unit. That is. Uh, the other, so we'll, we'll go through behavioural science or those aspects of it in a, in a bit more detail. Also, the other one is epidemiology. And this is, I think, the more serious argument, um, which is to say that if you have a lockdown, so what, what other countries are doing is, is, you know, trying to have quite serious social distancing measures already to try and stop people catching the disease from people who have it, especially people who have it and don't know they have it. Um, what the government are saying is that actually we don't want to stop everyone getting the disease because we need enough people to get the disease, enough young, healthy people to get the disease um, that the, that society develops some herd immunity. Uh, I want to stick with the behavioural science first. This is the idea that if you if you take what seem like obviously good measures, it could have unintended consequences. Um, so someone who explained this this morning was the chief scientist, Sir Patrick Valance, on Radio 4. He was asked, you know, like all these other countries are cancelling huge sporting events. Um, if, you know, as, as, as you said, you know, the, the chief scientist said yesterday, there might be 10,000 people in the population that have coronavirus and don't know, or I mean, 500 or so people know they've got it. So it could be 10,000 people who have it. So say, if we know that this many people have coronavirus, why are we encouraging people to go into these big, big spaces and hang out together when Ireland, when France are not doing that, when they've cancelled it? And what Patrick Valance said is that actually, look, if you, if you cancel the rugby match, which is outdoors, um, so there is some chance that people will catch it, but you know, it's better that they're outdoors, they would watch it in the pub. And if they're watching it in a pub, you've got a closed space, you've got a warm closed space, it's like lots of, lots of capacity for, for passing on the illness. You know, it's, it's one of those things where the, the moment he says it, it sounds reasonable, then you think for five seconds, you're like, well, what if you just cancelled the match? People are going to still watch if, the match in pubs as well. Well, it, yeah, exactly. So well, none of it also, happens if you do people, the match. What do, people do, what do people do before they go to a, a rugby match? They go to the pub. What do they do afterwards? They go to the pub. And how do they get there and back? On incredibly packed trains mm -hmm. or buses or whatever. So, and when you go into the stadium, you're patted down, et cetera. Yeah. And, and to be honest, a lot of, when, I, when I hear them talk about these, you know, these behavioral science, oh, but if you did this, something else would happen. It does sound a bit weak. It's, it's sort of like if you, if you tell people not to go into school, then people won't be able to work in the health service because they'll be looking after their kids. Well, there's an easy fix to that. What if you say school will only be open for people who work, for the children of people who do essential jobs, yeah, and I then you tell everyone else that they can stay off work? I think that's wise. I mean, it's, 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 it's sort of like that's a simple fix. So instead of saying, we're not going to close the schools because then healthcare workers might have to mm. take time off work, so we're just not going to do it, we're just not going to bother at all. Yeah. If you said, okay, well, that is a genuine problem, we should accept that. Yeah. So what logistics should, workers, yeah, social so, care workers. So what workers. should you do? You say school is only for people whose parents do essential jobs and everyone who's not doing an essential job is welcome to, to miss work and stay home and look after their mm. kids. So that's the behavioural science aspect. It's saying that the, the reason Britain are doing things differently to other countries is because we are better at behavioural science than them. So whilst France might think they're doing a smart thing in terms of banning sporting events, actually the French people are just going to gather in pubs and give it to themselves there. I mean, Belgium have banned pubs being open, so... It, I don't think it's a particularly strong argument. The other, the other argument the government are making is about epidemiology. It's a study of the spread of diseases and in particular herd immunity. Herd immunity. So what they're saying is if we shut down uh, society too early, if we, if we lock people in their homes, then by the time when we let them out, because not many people will have ever had the disease and not many people will have become immune to it, then at that point you'll get a second epidemic. Just as, just as big as the potential first one and maybe next winter. So sort of in an in a unideal time. It's quite a complex um, idea. 
And the best I've seen it explained was yesterday on Newsnight um, by Professor Graham Madley. So he's a professor of infectious disease modelling at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and academic chair of the Scientific Pandemic Influenza Group on Modelling. So a guy with many credentials to his name. This virus is, is going to be with us um, for a long time. We're going to have an epidemic and then it will become endemic and join in with all the other coronaviruses that we all have all the time but don't notice. We're going to have to generate what we call herd immunity. So that's a situation where the majority of the population are immune to the infection. And the only way of developing that in the absence of a vaccine is for the majority of the population to become infected. Ideally, if I could, what I would like to do is to put all the, all the more vulnerable people into the north of Scotland uh, and keep them there, everybody else into Kent and have a nice big epidemic in Kent so that everyone becomes immune and then we can put people back together again. But we can't do that. So what we're going to have to try and do, ideally, is some kind of manage this acquisition of herd immunity um, and, and minimise the exposure of, of people who, who are vulnerable. So clearly a very, clearly a very intelligent guy. And, and the, the point he's making is that, you know, what, what we want to happen to damage or to limit the deaths that happen from coronavirus and to limit, you know, the, I mean, the government seemed to be quite concerned about inconvenience or, or economic damage. We'll talk about that later as well. But what, what you want is for all the, you to develop herd immunity by enough young, healthy people getting it um, and then recovering from it and then being immune from it that, you know, society becomes... As a, as a collective, uh, less liable to epidemics. But the problem is, one, that you don't want everyone, even, even though you ultimately want a large proportion of the healthy population to get it, you don't want them all to get it at the same time because that could overwhelm the health system for those people who do, for whom the, the, the disease does become serious. The other problem, and I think this is the major one, um, is that he has sort of, this seems to be the, the model guiding the government. Um, but even though the government can't do what he what he has hypothetically suggested, which is to put all the older people in the north of Scotland and all the younger people in Kent to share the coronavirus around there, they don't seem to have done. Obviously, they can't do that, but they don't seem to have done anything really to separate younger people who they don't seem to mind getting coronavirus from older people. So, you know, they haven't they haven't suggested how they are going to. Was, also, how do we? I mean, how certain are we? That, I mean, how certain are we that people don't get coronavirus twice? From what I've read, they seem fairly confident. I mean, it would be it would be insane for them to have developed this whole no, I know policy system. Muta- if they didn't have the, some the claims are it's that. very its mutations are very slow, etc. So there's not very many concerns about that. But I mean, again, if there was a mutated version, could that compromise somebody's immune system if they'd had you know the other variant, etc. Potential. I mean, I haven't seen many people complain. So as I, as I was saying, because we're not epidemiologists, we're going to be talking about the, you know, the various debates that people are yeah, having. Who we're know synthesizing about this the information. Yeah. We're journalists. Um, and as far as I can tell, there aren't any you know, big dog credible scientists saying our big concern with this strategy is that actually people maybe can get coronavirus twice, three times, four times. No, no one said it's completely stupid. They've just said it's potentially riskier than it, than it would need to be. As we said, we're synthesizing information. We're going to go to now someone who is a genuine expert. Um, so this is, he was on Newsnight last night, very, very intelligent fella. Uh, Anthony Costello, uh, he is an ex-director of the World Health Organization. And he's not so sure about this strategy. He's not, he's not sure about the government strategy to let all the young people get coronavirus so that we develop some sort of herd immunity. Unlike other countries, the UK strategy aims to build herd immunity by allowing the steady spread of COVID-19. The government argue it will block a second peak in several months' time. Here are eight questions about this herd immunity strategy. One, will it impair efforts to restrict the immediate epidemic and cause more infections and deaths in the near term? Evidence suggests people shed virus early and those without symptoms may cause substantial spread. This argues for policies against mass gatherings, for school closures and for strict national and local measures for social distancing. Two, he's saying, will it weaken containment systems, testing, screening, radiography, isolation? China built a robust nationwide system of mobilised community workers for identifying cases promptly, isolating contacts and treating vulnerable people promptly to contain the outbreak. Three, does coronavirus cause strong herd immunity or is it like flu where new strains emerge each year needing repeated va- needing repeat vaccines? We have to learn much about COV immune responses. That's actually referring to what you were talking about, Aaron. So he is saying that we don't know enough um, that you couldn't develop a slightly different strain of coronavirus 
And then whilst we're, you know, all immune to the current strain of COVID-19, mm. you can get COVID-19.5, I know it's not how it works, but COVID-19.5, and then you, mm. you're able to, to get that. Um, I mean, the, the, the point is, if, if 40% of the global population gets it, there's going to, I mean, statistically, it's quite likely there's going to be a mutation, surely. I mean, I know they're saying it mutates very slowly. You get degrees of uh, mutation and different sort of velocities, et cetera, with, with regards to different viruses. But I mean, if fucking 40% of 7.5 billion people get it, there's going to be mutations, presumably. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, I, I'd say the main argument there is that, and, and I think his conclusion we'll get to in a moment, is, is that even we don't know at the, the moment, right? And we, we don't have a high degree of certainty. And so why, why take this incredibly high risk strategy? Um, four, he says, doesn't this herd immunity strategy conflict with WHO policy, World Health Organization policy? After the announcements of this being a pandemic, Dr. Tedros, Director General of the WHO, said the idea that countries should shift from containment to mitigation is wrong and dangerous. Um, so this is the idea that the government have now said, ah, fuck it, everyone can get it. We'll just try and make it as, as, as least disastrous as possible. Wait, so repeat that line again. The idea that countries should shift from containment to mitigation is wrong and dangerous. From containment to mitigation. The thing is, you know, we had the was the Harvard professor of epidemiology, Mark Lipsitch, said that forty to seventy percent of the global population is going to get it in the in the mid medium term in the next couple of years. That's been repeated by Fraulein Angela Merkel, you know, probably the most sober, serious, honest politician sort of amongst the major European politicians. So I mean, how how do you how do you contain that? I understand the containment strategy in so much as you only have so much healthcare capacity, so many hospital beds. So you don't want to overburden mm. that system all in one go. But in terms of actually containing the virus so that not many people get it, I mean, I don't see, I don't see how that, or, or is he's, or is the, or is the, is, are they sort of insinuating there that it can be contained until there's a vaccine within the next 12 to 18 months or what? Do we shut down the global economy for 18 months? Well, so I suppose what the, that's the, what the Tories are refusing the, to do effectively, right? They the, don't want to shut down the economy to... The WHO have been very, deaths. if you read their reports, they've been very complimentary about how China and Taiwan and South Korea have dealt with it. And, and they've dealt with it by saying, we just need to stop this virus dead um, and take quite serious action to make sure that doesn't happen. Pour tons and tons of resources in it. You had, I think, 40,000 people went from different uh, regions of China to work in Wuhan. You know, so you you had a mobilization of resources, which is, you know, completely unheard of in, in, in the European countries, which is why they were quite effective at stopping the spread. And that does just give people more time to understand what's going on. No, I get that. But the second Wuhan goes back to business as usual, let's say in two months, and then you have tourists there and you you have the spread of infection, you have social institutions at like schools, workplaces open again, it's going to happen all over well, that's again. Well, that's the government's argument. Um, I don't, I'm not saying I agree. With, I mean, can I, can I just say I don't, I'm not saying I agree with the government, but it, it might be that you know maybe the, in terms of if you if you if from a utilitarian perspective you want to absolutely minimise deaths, you say look, we're just going to have to shut down society for 12 months, 18 months until there's a vaccination. I get that, but but the, the, and the WHO by attacking or people who are disagreeing, people in, in positions of power and knowledge with regards to the healthcare profession, disagreeing with the government, that seems to be their implicit argument, but nobody's actually saying that. Well, let's, so his next tweet kind of answers you, which is helpful. So he says, shouldn't we wait to see the China situation? They've contained the epidemic after seven weeks of intense national effort. Will their strengthened systems not contain outbreaks quickly? What is their herd immunity? So he's saying, look, potentially it will be the case that China get a second, a second burst of it. And maybe next time around, they'll have to go for a strategy which looks like what the government's current strategy is. But why would we not wait to see? Which kind of makes sense to me. Number six, without an all-out national mobilisation plan for social distancing, are the UK government behavioural and nudge strategies really evidence-based to flatten the peak or simply based on models? Um, and on the precautionary principle, shouldn't we go all out to snuff this UK epidemic out with national mobilisation at all levels using all possible preventative measures, whether evidence is strong, uncertain or weak, and worry about herd immunity when we have more evidence? Can we freeze that for a sec? The question would be, isn't there an opportunity cost? So if you're, if you're deploying those kinds of resources, if you're, if you're shutting down... Parts of the economy to such an extent that you can do that. You know, to what extent are healthcare workers? We've got 4 million people in this country waiting for operations. We've got people who've got cancer, you know, onset cancer, and they need to have that cancer removed. We've got elderly people who need just care. They need to be, you know, looked after and, you know, cleaned and visited, etc. Uh, so, you know, you might have some people who are suicidal. They have mental health care workers. They need to see it, etc. So, you know, there's an opportunity cost. If you deploy all of these human resources into this one thing, I mean, do you see what I'm saying? That, 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 I see what you're saying. Well, I, I suppose, again, why is there not that, that, that sort of, that conversation? Well, so, and this is, this is where I worry, actually, because 
what you're saying is you, we could make a decision as a society that we're willing to take the risk and we're willing to take the risk because the the economic costs and the costs not related to coronavirus of 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 implementing a shutdown at this point in time would be too high so we might as well risk a few people's lives well i said there's two alternatives um, that's one of them the other one is you shut that you literally shut down the running of the modern economy which means under neoliberalism society basically people don't leave their houses you only have absolutely you know critically inten- uh, important jobs carrying on etc and then you say, well, we're just going to wait for a vaccine in 12 to 18 months. And yeah, we're going to take a contraction of GDP by 25, 35%. Those to me seem the two things you do. No, so I'd say, I'd say there's a middle ground, right? So, so a middle ground would be what places like Taiwan are doing or even what Italy is doing in a way is so you, you, you implement quite extreme social distancing measures and then you could in a graduated way bring life back to normal and see how it goes. So if you, if you implement social distancing measures at this point, then potentially you could say, oh, actually, well, we were never we were never confining health workers to their homes anyway. We were never confining a bunch of people who work in essential services to their homes. Then sort of like, if it seems like you've got it under control, then you let this part of the economy start again. You let this part of society start again. And you do it slowly in a controlled manner. So you're you're fairly confident that you're not going to get that overwhelming spike. That may be the case. But like I said, the government is saying, we'll take this as Boris Johnson so charmingly puts it, on the chin. That's not a known solution. It's, it, it seems to me there are, there are two quite plausible solutions with high sort of um, degrees of certainty as to what they would mean. So the government's sort of sort of conclusion here is, yeah, things will carry on. Maybe two to 400,000 people will die. That's what they're doing. Mm. And then you could say, look, you know what? We want to keep deaths down to 50,000 or below. This is what we're going to mm. do. The economy takes a hit. This thing in the middle, it might work. It might not work. You'll have economic contraction. Then you go back to life to normal. Then you have economic contra- contraction again. I mean, but the government haven't been honest about saying that what we're willing to accept is two hundred to four thousand. That's what I mean. Four hundred thousand. That's what dying. I mean. Because what they're suggesting is that this herd immunity will actually mean less older people die, because they're saying that if 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 you just keep having wave after wave after wave, the older people will die. But what they haven't suggested is how they're going to separate the old people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We'll just go to the final one, um, and then I want to go to a graph. So the final tweet: Vaccines are a safer way to develop herd immunity without the risks associated with the disease itself. Is it ethical to adopt a policy that threatens immediate casualties on the basis of an uncertain future benefit? And I want to get out this graph because this graph was again on Newsnight. They said they got it from the Lancet, and I think this really just helps you understand all the different theories. So we've got the the red the red graph or the red line. Sorry, it's showing you on the on the y axis. You've got cases being reported. On the x-axis, you've got months since transmission established. So this red line, that's showing if it if you get exponential growth and the virus gets out of control and, you know, 60% of society get it all at one time. Um, obviously, you don't want that because health services get overwhelmed. There's not much opportunity to, to protect older and more vulnerable citizens. It's, we should also know it's not just older people. It's also people with disabilities or people with suppressed immune systems. If it all happens that quickly, there's no time to protect the vulnerable fundamentally. The main concern with the red line is that loads of people die. In the red phase, people aren't being isolated. So that's the whole point. We could just decide that we're going to let it continue. All the, all the young and healthy people who are the people who form, you know, the basis of the, of the labor force anyway, they can continue with a few sniffles and a bit of a cough. You know, some people barely notice they've got it. The economy would continue as, 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 as it had been. And then a bunch of people who are economically inactive anyway, die. Right. So that would, that would be the sort of like ultimate neoliberal capitalist we 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 value capital and we value wealth over everything else that's what you do you wouldn't have any controls whatsoever um the green option is is to say you slow it down um so you slow down the spread so ultimately again you're looking at sort of 60 to 70 percent of the population getting it before they develop herd immunity but you slow it down with measures like social isolation um and then that means that the health service is never overwhelmed you have the chance to sort of separate older people and, and more vulnerable people from the from the ill population and then you, you you limit casualties. That's the green one. And then the blue one, this is what the government is saying they want to avoid. So the blue one is when you get a few cases, that's when you have absolute lockdown. So you have absolute lockdown, cases go down to zero, but then because you can't lock people in their homes forever, you have to let them out again. And the moment you let them out, there is still coronavirus around either because some people still have it in the community or because you know there's, there's still a global pandemic going on and then because no one's got herd immunity you then get another epidemic situation so the, the point being that <laughs> all that all those months that you spent locked down were pointless 
So disagreements about the government response are fundamentally the government say they're on the green line and they're avoiding the blue line, which is what they say countries like Taiwan, who've had a more you know, shut down system of doing. But then what people um, like, I've forgotten his name already, the Anthony Costello. So he was the guy who was the next director of the World Health Organization. What they're saying is actually, yeah, this is fine in theory, but what the government have implemented would actually put us on the red line. Because he's saying if you've got 10,000 people who currently have coronavirus in this country and you're not really doing anything to separate anyone, mm. then you are very close to getting to this completely overwhelming outbreak. So, so he's saying the government are putting us or the government are definitely risking putting us on the red line. And given that, you know, if, if, if you're looking at this graph and you say, what's, what's the best outcome, the green line? What's the worst outcome is the red line? So then you thought you'd aim somewhere between the green line and the blue line. And, and the British government seems to be aiming somewhere between the green line and the red line. So can I ask you, given that their voter base is, is older voters, why would they be front-loading several hundred thousand deaths almost on purpose? Yeah, so that's what seems very... I mean, this Chris Giles, I think, from the FT was tweeting precisely that. He was saying, like, even if hypothetically this makes sense, there's a sort of time lag. So it, it could be that in, in two years, we look back at the government policy and say, oh, that was kind of clever, because whilst we had more deaths... In spring 2020, France had more deaths in spring 2021. But the point is, and this is what Chris Giles, this is, I think, economics editor at the, the Financial Times, he was saying that if, if we have a period where, because France is in lockdown, they have 500 deaths in April, and because we don't have lockdown, we have 2,000 deaths mm. in, in, in UK, then the government are going to struggle to continue with that yeah. particular policy, right? Yeah. So, so there is a concern. So fr you're right, front-loading the deaths could be could be a big a, problem. A strategic comms nightmare. You know, look, I'll be like, look, tell, tell the political editor of the Daily Mail, look, we'll be, give it yeah. six months. Actually. More deaths now for less deaths later. It's never been a particularly good yeah. slogan, yeah. especially when the whole, the whole idea that there's going to be less deaths later is, is somewhat disputed. Yeah.